Hymn number 78, I Stand in Awe. To marvelous or work, to wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you, and I stand, I stand in awe of you, I stand, I stand in awe of you, holy God to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you, holy God. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. Pastor, will you open our time, please? Father, we thank you so much for the day. We thank you for those that have gathered today uh, to, to hear your word and to, to sing your praise. And so, Father, as we, we stand in awe, we pray that each one of us are renewed and and bless uh, for coming, but, but most of all, that we, we hear from you. We ask that you speak to us today, and, and your Holy Spirit is here to guide us. And we, just, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Uh, you see the revival service coming up September 27th through the 29th. Uh, please be in prayer for that. Uh, Awana's return September 30th. So if you have any kids that need to get pre registered, uh, talk to Crystal or, or Pastor Justin about that uh that's all i see does anybody else have any other announcements and number 314. oh hail the power of jesus name let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and drown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem, and drown him, Lord of all. Chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves us by his grace and ground him, Lord of all. Hail him who saves us by his grace and crown him. Lord of all, let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball, to him all majesty ascribe and ground him, Lord of all, to him all majesty ascribe and drown him Lord of all Oh that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall 
will join the everlasting song and ground him word of all will join the everlasting song and crown him word of all what prayers you bring today <clears throat> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Father, we do love you, and we just uh, pray, Father God, that uh, all these requests that are sent up today, Father, we just uh, know you are a sovereign, sovereign God, Lord, and we just uh, lay them all at your throne. Those with physical needs, Father, we just pray that you'll be with the doctors and nurses, especially be with the military, Father, as they fight for our freedom to come and freely worship you and just to... Uh, be with the leaders of this country, Father God. Just uh, give them wisdom to make uh, decisions based on your will. The upcoming election, Father, just help us to uh, make the right choices and, and just to, uh, to understand, Father God, that uh, you put people in positions uh, where you want them, and we just have to accept that and support that, uh, especially support our president as he uh, moves forward, as we... Uh, should also support our pastor. We just lift him up today, Father, and just uh, ask a special blessing on his message. We just pray, Father God, that uh, we'll better understand it and apply it in our lives much better than uh, than we've been, and and just to uh, follow you and just to serve you, Lord. We just uh, thank you for what you do in the ministry of this church, Father, and the upcoming Awanas. We just pray that you'll be with the schools as well as the children return, just be with the teachers, and just to... Uh, Make everything go smoothly as can be. We just thank you for this day you've given us, Father God. We just pray, Lord, as we go further into this worship, that uh, we just bring you the honor and glory that you deserve, Father. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Hymn number 473. Four seventy three. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk when we walk close to thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Jesus is my plea, daily walking close to thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be, through this world of toil and snares, if I falter, Lord, who cares, with me my burden shares none but thee dear lord none but thee just a closer walk with thee granted jesus is my plea daily walking close to thee let it be dear lord let it be when my feeble life is old time for me will be no more guide me gently safely oh to thy kingdom shore to thy shore Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Amen.
Good morning. Sorry, we're missing one of our tech guys, so I was playing double duty there. Um, if you will turn to the book of Jonah, it is uh, sandwiched between Obadiah and, um, and I just had a brain fart. What's the one? Micah, isn't it? Yeah, Micah. Wow, okay. Um, I don't know about y'all, but it's been a weird week. Uh, I have, I've used parts of my brain this week that have been uh, in, in storage for a long time. Uh, Brandy is, is the new math teacher at the school, and part of my husband's duties this week was to help her prepare to teach math. I'm a former art teacher. I don't, I don't, I don't teach math. Um, I, barely, I barely do math. Uh, not that I can't, I just don't like it. Um, she, was, she was doing one-on-one lesson and I just kind of groaned and put my head down like, ugh. So anyway, I'm always sympathetic to students who are like, I don't like math. I'm like, well, but you gotta learn it, so suck it up. Anyway, um, but I am glad to be here. Uh, I do want to open us up in prayer, and, and we're, this is our last of the Sunday School stories. Uh, we're going to finish with Jonah, um, and I think it's very appropriate that we're going to finish with Jonah, and I'll explain that uh, here in a little bit, but let's, let's begin in prayer. Father, we, we thank you for the day. We thank you that regardless of the circumstances um, that, we can, that we can sing to you, and, and that we can we can just gather in your name, that we can open your word. Father, we thank you that you sent your son to die for us, that, that we can have this relationship, that we can, we can send our prayers and we can know that they're, they're heard and they're listened to and that you care for us. We thank you that through the death of your son and his resurrection that we have eternal life, and, and part of that eternal life is that, it, that you give us your Holy Spirit. And so through your Holy Spirit, we can, we can hear what you have for us, that we can listen and Father, just that, that still small voice of, of just listening as you guide us, as, as, we, as we can look at the stories of Elijah. But Father, as we open up the word and we, and we look at your servant Jonah, uh, it's, it's very apparent that Jonah is, is probably not one that we should aspire to be like, and yet he's one that many of us find ourselves uh, behaving just like. So Lord, as, as we look at this story, I pray that your spirit uses it to, to cut us to the heart, and that we understand our own uh, failures to, to live um, uh, to the standard and to the boldness that you call us to. So Father, that even though we know that it can be very um, hurting and devastating when we recognize our failures, we also can celebrate your grace and your mercy that tomorrow and today is a new day, and that regardless of what has happened in the past, that we can this, from this time forward be, uh, be your servants and be obedient and be bold. So, Father, I pray today that we boldly look to your word and we boldly look at our own, um, our own failures so that we can grow from them. And by your grace, we can be saved and we be rejuvenated to what you have for us. And so, Father, we just thank you for that. And we thank you for your spirit. And I ask that he, he opens our eyes and our ears to have what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Jonah, the unwilling prophet. Um, there's, there's a few stories in the Bible that are kind of my, my go-to stories, um, and Jonah's one of them. And one of the reasons is, is, is very, very short, because this is going to be a long sermon. By the way, those of y'all that are like, is this going to be long today? Yes, so buckle up. But one of the things that Jonah um, it, it works for me is I remember about 15 years old is when I was called to the ministry. So as a teenager, uh, I'd gone to camp, I had uh, done a lot of some things with the youth and whatnot, and, and just through a, a series of, of, of circumstances, God used that um, and opened the door and said, hey, by the way, uh, you're, you are going to, to minister in my name. And I, I said, Lord, that sounds awesome, let's do it. Um, then fast forward a relatively short time, and I realized what that entails. And, and part of that was we, we ended up moving. Uh, my dad got a new job in Texas, and so we moved to South Texas, and nothing against Texas in and of itself, but that was just a very bad time in my life. Um, and so that pulled me far away from the ministry. Actually, I, I pulled a Jonah, is, is what it amounts to, and ran far away. And, uh, and then I was not swallowed by a fish, but through, again, through some ordeals and circumstances, uh, God was like, okay, are you done now because it's, it's time to get back to the task at hand? And one of the stories that I went to as a teenager before I ran away and, and, and in kind of in follow-up afterwards was Jonah because it's amazing uh, when you read this story, you're like, uh, I mean, it's very easy to put yourself in Jonah's shoes. 
Um, and especially as somebody who's, who knows that there's a calling on their life to, to, to preach or teach, to do, you know, I knew it was something, uh, you know. Um, and then to be like, no, I'm running away from that. It's, I mean, this, this, so Jonah for me is a very personal story. Um, so we are going to read the whole thing. Um, it's not that long. You'll be okay. Uh, but, but just know that, that what I say today, it, it, it comes not just out of the word, but also experience. So um, if, I, if I sound harsh at times, I'm just preaching to myself. So there you go. Um, I'm sure you're not anything like myself or Jonah, and, and all of you are willingly obedient all the time, 24-7, right? So, so this is just for me. Y'all can take a nap if you need to. All right. I kid, don't sleep. All right. Uh, but we are going to open it up and begin in Jonah chapter 1. Uh, and we are going to read, read the whole chapter. So like I said, buckle up. All right. <clears throat> the Word of God says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give us a thought to us, give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you, that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, and then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So we have the, the opening chapter, which, of course, just is, is action-packed right off the bat. Uh, Jonah is told, arise and go to Nineveh, because he's going to preach to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh is not in Israel. This is a, this is a pagan country. This is, this is not a part of Israel. So what we have in the Old Testament is a call for one of God's prophets to go and evangelize. He's, he's supposed to go proclaim uh, a message from the Lord to the pagans. So for those of you that are like, did, did, they evangelize, did Jews evangelize people in the Old Testament? Was that a thing? It was supposed to be a thing. But we see in Jonah that sometimes they didn't do a good job. So, but why is Nineveh so bad? Why does he not want to go to Nineveh? Well, it's the city of Nimrod. That's what's known as. Uh, Nimrod was the first great king named in the Bible uh, way back in Genesis. Uh, but Nimrod was known for his violent rule. And then the subsequent kings in Nineveh at, uh, and the city as a whole, they became known as a violent place. So Ashur Benipal, just for an example, he was known to remove the lips and hands of his victims. And then Tiglath Pileser, he would flay his victims alive. While they're alive, he's stripping flesh off them. And he would create piles of skulls to celebrate his victories, right? So these are, these are, this is a violent city led by violent people. And if you've read or watched the VeggieTales version, you also know that the people had a habit of slapping each other with fish. And they would just go around with carp and whatnot. Some of y'all giggle. Some of y'all need to watch VeggieTales. Anyway. Uh, so, I mean, this, this is a horrible place. This is, this is not, I mean, most people would not want to be there, but it, it's a violent, horrible place. Which brings us to the first point. The worst cities are the ones who need the gospel the most, right? So even though this is a very violent city, God has told Jonah, my, my wrath is about to come upon them, so you need to go just let them know. Now, why, right? I mean, if it's so violent, why doesn't God just smite the place like Sodom and Gomorrah and be done with it? Well, apparently, 
Because God knows that these people are ready for the message. They're ready to hear. They're ready to turn from their sin. We see that later. Spoiler alert. But they're not. But somebody has to go tell them. And Jonah, of course, says, oh, I, I don't want to do that. So he runs. He flees. Tarshish is, is, uh, is probably in southern Spain. There's, there's some debate in where exactly in the Mediterranean it is. Um, if it is southern Spain, then it's literally the other side of the world for, uh, for the Israelites. This is, I mean, the other side of the Mediterranean might as well, like for us, it'd be like going to China. Um, you also get implications in the text. Remember that, that a lot of times people thought of that God is regional. And so, so uh, Jonah might be thinking, maybe if I go to the other side of the world, then, then God won't see me. I'll be able to actually get away from him. Um, but that brings us to point two, right? There's nowhere that is too far for God to find you. So for those of us that find ourselves running away and we think, well, maybe if I go here or if I do this or, or maybe if I hang out with these people, you, God will eventually just ignore me and, and I, can, I, can just, I can go live my life as I want to live and God won't bother me. And then what we find out is, no, there's nowhere for us to hide. That when God has called us as Christians, and especially as a Christian community, if we are called to a task, that has been appointed to us, there's nowhere we can go, there's nothing we can do that God is going to say, oh, well, I guess I forgot, I'll just let it go. That we, we've been given a task to do, and God has put it on our hearts, God has put it on our minds, it's been ordained, it's that this is what should happen, this is what needs to happen, and so that is, that is the task at hand. So we, can, we have, each of us, a God-given task. This is your next point in your bulletin. It's better to avoid the fish, right, quote-unquote, metaphor, by getting after it rather than running away. And again, I speak that from experience. I could have saved myself a lot of heartache in my life if I had just done what I was supposed to do in the beginning. And how many of us can say that you can look back at your point in your life and you say, you know, if I had just done it the way I was supposed to originally, I probably could have avoided a lot of problems in my life. And that's, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. So what do we learn from that? From this day forward, just, just get after it. You have a task to do, get after it. God has given us a task, so better to do it now than to try to run away, and then whatever catastrophe comes, whatever fish swallows us up, and then spend three days in the belly of a nasty fish until we figure out, maybe I should have listened to God in the first place. Right, Jonah only got three days. Some of us had several years, just saying. But the worst cities are the ones that need the gospel. Jesus said, it's not for the healthy that I've come, but for the sick. Nineveh had brought itself under the wrath of God because of their violence, but God was ready to do something great. He was going to demonstrate his love to this very violent city. And then if we look uh, again, now not only not means Christians, we cannot run from God. It also means as we share the gospel with those around us, there's no one that's too lost for God to save. Right, So if you think about the flip side of that, as Christians, we can't run away from God that God is going to just forget about us. But that also means that for those of us, when we, we've been called to speak to somebody, whether that be to a city, to a person, to a family member, to a coworker, to whatever, if God has laid it on our hearts to share and talk with that person, just know that God's already been at work in that person, that there's, there's already something happening there. We know from history, when we look back at the timeline of, of the Assyrian Empire, in Jonah's day, this is actually one of the worst times for Nineveh. They, they are in economic distress. They have had poor leadership. Remember, the Assyrian Empire was supposed to be a very large empire, and yet the way it reads that Nineveh is, is on its own. It's just one city, which tells us that there's a lot of disunity among the cities, and it's not even really an empire at this point. So had so if Jonah doesn't go, Nineveh is on the verge of just total collapse, not just because of their sin and spiritual collapse, but their very real physical collapse is going on as well. So let's, uh, as we kind of go through this, just kind of think God is doing something with Nineveh. Jonah is to be instrumental in what God is doing. And what is his response? What is the man of God's response? He runs and flees. This is, this is the great failure of Jonah right there, and, and we'll continue on with that here in a minute. Now, this does do to the perennial question of, of the fish, right? Because you read in 17, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of fish three days and three nights. And of course, as every good Sunday school lesson goes, there's always a question from the kid, did that really happen? Was it really a fish? I heard it was a whale, but whales are mammals. They're not fish. Right, and I say it that way because I've had little snotty kids say it that way to me. So, 
To answer that question, it's very simple. First off, whales can be fish if you just think about it, all right? The whole idea of whales being mammal, that's a modern thing, that's, that's a new categorization, right? If it has fins and it swims in the ocean, it's probably a fish, right, Robert? I mean, for the most part, most, so it's not that big a deal to call a whale a fish unless you're one of these left brain people that really, you know, they get have to be just so, all right? But more important than that, Right. Oh, by the way, I learned that there is a thing called a whale shark, which is a fish, and it is big enough to swallow people. You can Google uh, how many divers have almost been swallowed by a whale shark, um, which is funny to me. I think <laughs> I love the ocean, so my thing is like, how do you how do you miss the giant fish that's swimming your way that's about to eat you? But anyway, um, but more important, right, than whether or not it's a fish or whale or whatever. More important is this is the Lord we're talking about. All right, so in our Sunday school stories, we talked about he created the world out of nothing. He's, he's flattened city walls that were, that were supposed to be impenetrable. He's, he's brought, uh, you know, he calls people up to heaven with, with fire and whirlwind. He's flooded the earth. Of all the stories, right, that, that we read about in the Bible, it's funny to me that people are like, a fish can't swallow a human. Well, if God can create the fish out of nothing to begin with, I'm pretty sure he can make a nice big whopper, right, that's big enough to swallow a guy. Ne never mind that he's in the belly for three days. How's he surviving that? That's the miracle that he's surviving it. But anyway. I digress and move on. All right, let's continue in reading chapter 2. Because as Jonah is in the belly of the fish, in that dark, nasty place, he offers up a prayer. Let's, let's begin reading chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. O Lord, my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land, which is probably a most humorous ending for a very solemn prayer. The guy just, I mean, imagine you're sitting on the beach, and some fish falls up, spits a guy out. And that's, that's a vacation you don't forget. So... But Jonah is in the belly of the well, right? And he, and he calls out to the Lord. And, and, it, and that phrase there, out of the belly of Sheol, Sheol is, is, is the grave. It's uh, the burial place. And it's, it's just an old Hebrew word. So don't let that trip you up. But Jonah's prayer, it points us to a few truths concerning Scripture that, that are in your bulletin. So first off, the Lord will hear our prayers even in our darkest moments in life. It's, it's fascinating to me. And it's, it's encouraging. It's amazing. I don't, I don't even know the right word for it. But it's, it's just so amazing that at the points of, uh, of my life and the points of our lives where we think, has God completely forsaken me? What is going on? Um, and, and, and God, do you even hear me when I cry out? It's, it's that moment that God does hear us. And typically, it's when he's, he's actually speaking the loudest if we will just, just move away from distractions and just listen to what he has for us. So God does hear our prayers, even in the darkest moments of life. And John is in the belly fish for three days. He's Three days, right, without food. He's, he's, it's a stinky place. I'm sure it's dark, right? And it appears all hope is lost, but the Lord hears Jonah's prayer and sustains him, which brings us to the second point. The Lord will sustain us in those darkest moments, even if it seems impossible. So at those moments in our life where, where catastrophe has happened, we, we have no clue if God even hears our prayers. We can say, yes, he does hear us because we can look at those times and also see how he has sustained us through those times as well. That even in our, even in our rebellion, right, that even in our sin, Christ died for us. And even in our sin, Christ will sustain us. And if we will just turn to him and repent, then we will see that for what it is. And we, will, uh, and we, we can get out of the fish. The most miraculous part of the story, right? It's, I don't think that it's that Jonah was swallowed by a fish. That that does happen. You can like there are stories of divers who've been swallowed by different uh, animals, but that he's able to survive three days' journey inside that fish. 
And I, and I do think it's funny that he's sailing far away and there's a storm to, to throw him out and then the fish gets him and apparently it takes about three days for that fish to swim back to, uh, to where he's supposed to be. So, but Jonah has an appointed task and this fish is going to be the means to, uh, Jonah's means to renewing that task. Which brings us to the last point there for chapter two. The Lord will use those dark moments to remind us of our life purpose. I, I think back to some of those darker times and, and, and those, those times when I was running from the Lord, but the number of opportunities that I had to share the gospel with people. Now, since I was running from the Lord, obviously I did not take advantage of a lot of those opportunities. I've, I've got one flash in my head right now that typically comes back. And, and, and I can only pray that God has sent somebody else that was more willing and more obedient than, than what I was doing that day. But if, if, we are, if we'll just, just sit back for a second... And, and take the feelings out of it because those feelings can be very, they can lie to us because those, those feelings of fear, those feelings of failure, the feelings of guilt, if we, can, if we can step back from those and just remember that we serve a God who created us out of nothing, who created us for a purpose, with a purpose, and that God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us, even despite our sin, despite our failings, so the great love of God has been demonstrated in that he died for us. Then those times of darkness and times of rebellion in our lives, they, they can be reminders of God's grace. And the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus takes our failures and takes our, our, our fears and takes our doubts and he flips them around and uses them for his glory. And so now those failures in my life have actually transformed me to be more bold, to take advantage of the opportunities to share the gospel when I have those opportunities, to, to realize that though there are people in my life that I just do not like because they look different, they smell different, they act different, or whatever, God sent his son to die for them as well. And if I take stock of my own failures, I remember that as far as me and God, I look different, act different, smell different, and I'm a whole lot, I'm not, anything like God either and yet God sent his son to die for me and the beauty of that is God sent his son to die for you as well so that if you yourself feel stinky and sin riddled and, and a failure and you're guilt ridden you can know that the great love of God is this that even while you were a sinner and while in your failure and in your darkest moment Christ died for you too so that you can have eternal life, so that you can be transformed, so that you can be what God has designed you to be. And we can boldly step into our God-given task. And we don't have to be riddled with fear. And one of the things that's been bugging me recently are these things right here. And it's not because they're uncomfortable, it's not because I sweat or whatever, but because they've been such a distraction in our lives. Even in my own life. If you're more comfortable wearing a mask, wear a mask. I don't really care at this point because I'm not worried about a pandemic. I'm worried about people of God who, like Jonah, have gone astray and are unwilling to step into their task because we've been distracted. Is it a real problem? I, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But physical danger should not inhibit the people of God who should not be afraid of what kills the body, but cannot kill the soul. Fear the Lord who can kill both body and soul. So again, for those of y'all that want to politicize that statement, it's not a political statement. Wear the mask, don't wear the mask. I don't care. But what I care about is that there are people dying and going to hell, and we're too busy arguing about whether we should wear a stupid mask. Yeah. Moving on. Chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. <clears throat> Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. 
The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and satin ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they had did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So we see in chapter 3 just the shortest revival message of all time. It's, it's a single sentence, and what does that single sentence do? It cuts to the heart of Nineveh. And we, and we see that, and we read that, and we realize the Lord works in the hearts of people long before we enter the scene with a message of hope. The, the beauty of serving God is that he does pretty much all the work for us. I mean, we, we just come in at the end of it, and just and we're more cleanup duty than anything else. Like I said before, Nineveh was in a state of just economic ruin. Their, their leadership had failed. Their, their agricultural system was, was not doing so hot. There, there, was, uh, there was lack of food in some areas. The empire had almost dissolved. So they're, they're ready to hear something. They already know disaster's coming because they, they've already seen it a lot. So for this guy to show up and say, look, more is coming, just so you know, well, that, they're, that's it. They're done. They're, okay, this is, we, our gods have failed. We, this God is saying that more is coming. We will turn to him. And notice what the king says, right? He, he goes through this whole proclamation of that everybody's going to fast. Everybody's going to wear sackcloth. And he says, let everybody turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. In verse 9, he says, who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger. It's amazing when a pagan king understands the gospel better than God's people. Because he understands, look, if, if, if God is giving us a warning, that means there might be hope. Well, Christian, yes, there is hope. Disaster may come upon us because of our sin, but there is hope because Christ has died for us. Eternal life is readily available. So for those of you that are in your sin and you've never turned to Christ and you think, is there hope for me? Yes, there is hope for you because we've all sinned. We've all fallen short and we can all be saved and have eternal life if we will just turn to him and turn from our evil ways. So judgment and destruction can be avoided if we will only repent from our evil and call on the Lord for salvation. I mean, that's the gospel right there. Destruction is coming. And, and we all know that, even, even non-Christians at a very basic level, we understand that death is fast approaching. We're all mortal. So how do we avoid that? How do we avoid that destruction? We turn to Christ. And even if we physically die, we know that we will have eternal life in him because he's, he, he died for us. He resurrected. And here's the thing. If, if somebody comes to you and says, I have the secret to immortal life, they might be crazy. But if that person dies and then they come back to life, they they'll probably have something going for them that you can listen to. That's exactly what Jesus did. How do we know we have eternal life? Because Christ died and came back. That's, that's the proof right there. And if Christ says, I go to a prepared place for you, I can give you eternal life as well, and then he dies and he proves that he has the power over life and death, then we know that he has power over life and death, and we can trust in him. So judgment and destruction, they can be avoided. We just have to repent from our evil and call on the Lord for salvation. Now, before we finish this chapter or this book, notice the giant irony that you might not have caught because it's not explicit in Jonah. If we remember that Nineveh is a part of the Assyrian Empire, Later, what does the Assyrian Empire do to Israel? They conquer the northern kingdom. Jonah goes and preaches to people who repent, and their empire is restored, and then that same empire becomes a tool for the destruction of Israel. Or not the destruction, at least, the, the, the conquering. It's, it's fascinating irony. This is, this is one of those parts of the Bible where you're like, wait, did God really do that? Yes, God's people who were rebellious, right? They knew the truth, and yet they chose not to follow it, were conquered by pagans who had no knowledge of God, but through a one-sentence message were restored and became tools of God to, to mold Israel to what they were going to do. It's one of those giant ironies of the Old Testament that's not talked about. 
And it still happens today. God uses those who are willing to be used. He, he's, those that are obedient, those that are, are doing the tasks that they've been given, they are the ones that God uses. So as a church, if we think, why, why do we not see salvations? Why do we not see people come? Why, why do we see a, a decline? Why, do we see, like, why are we seeing these tragedies befall our church? If, if we sit back and think to ourselves, well, are we in sin? Are we in rebellion? Or are we obediently walking? Right? It, it, that might be the issue. And that's, that's where it gets hard for us because it, as individual Christians, it's hard. I know, I know that, that was, that was a major gut check moment in my life when, when I was praying in bed and I, I thought, God, I have run so far away. I don't even know which way is up anymore. And I, I need you to turn me right side. I mean, we know that as an individual. Imagine that as a collective group of people who are trying to, and, we, and we're all trying to figure out which way is up. This is, this is why I say we've got to remove the distractions and focus on what God is telling us. And, it, and it's amazing to me that Jonah's message was one sentence. Just one sentence. Destruction is about to fall on you. And that was enough for everybody. Which is, which is hope for those of us that we're, we want to evangelize. We know God is calling us to share the gospel, but we say things like, well, I don't, I don't know what to say, or what if they ask questions I don't know the answer to. Listen, Jonah had it down in one sentence, and we already established that he wasn't the greatest prophet, right? So that's hope for those of us that struggle with how to speak. What do we say? What do we say? You just share what is God doing for you? How, what has God done in your life? What is, how has he saved you? What, what has Christ done for you? Share that. If they ask a question you don't know, you say, well, I don't know, but we can look at it together. We'll figure it out later together. Right? It's, 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 it, evangelism is not a difficult thing. It's just, it's just a, one of those things you have to be obedient to do. Because if you don't know, it's, it, well, God's already said two things to us. One, just be honest, right? That's right. Don't speak lies. Be honest. But two, Christ even said the Spirit will tell you what to say when the time comes. So this is why we have to listen to the Holy Spirit. And we, as we obediently walk, we also listen. To what God, what do you want me to say to this person? And for some of us, we have to remember that sometimes God wants us to shut up. And so we have to keep our mouths closed and just listen for a while. Some of you are like, wait, that's not my Bible. It's Trust me, you, sometimes you have to be quiet. It's just better that way. That's me. Anyway, uh, let's continue on. All right, chapter, we're going to read the last of in chapter 4. But... Right, this great revival happens. And what happens? But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? And we have an abrupt end there. It's, it's one of those endings where you're like, wait, I mean, what happens next? What, so does Jonah change his mind? What's going on? It's an abrupt ending because that's, that's the point of the story. Jonah, you are really concerned about this plant that miraculously popped up over a night and, and instead of 120,000 people that were on their way to death and hell. Right? What's more important, Jonah, the plant or the people? And, and, and Jonah, you can only imagine him just sitting there moping, right? And, and he's just, well, people, I guess, you know, it's just, it's ridiculous. But if you look at verse 1, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, right? Literally in the Hebrew, it's, it was exceedingly evil to Jonah. This is, this, is, this is one of those very harsh statements. Jonah is, he's not just mad, 
He's not just jealous. I mean, he, he feels like this is an evil act upon himself. And, and why is it so bad? Jonah says, well, I told you, God, this is what happened. You're, you're so loving and, and you're so merciful to people that now they're not going to die. And, and, and I was kind of hoping to see some fire and brimstone. Right. I mean, this is this is this is like a, a just a, a bratty little kid. Amen is right. And of course, I, you know, and again, why am I so harsh? Because I myself, bratty little kid. And every once in a while, I find myself being a bratty little kid. And some of y'all are way up there in age. <laughs> and yet still, every once in a while, I, I tell people, adults are just kids that are older. And, and, and every once in a while, I have an adult says, no, they're not. And I'm like, okay, prove my point, whatever. I mean, that's, but we're all people. It's just, it's a part of the human condition that we, we, we want what we want, right? And we get really comfortable about something. And, 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 and that's Jonah's sin. Jonah's sin was preferring Nineveh's destruction over Nineveh's salvation. I mean, how bad do you have to be to want 120,000 people to burn up? Well, they, but they slap people with fishes and they're mean and they're violent and they should die, right? I mean, this, this, but how many people of God do we hear that today? Well, I don't want to. I don't want to go talk to them. They're they're bad people. They do bad things. Well, newsflash: we all do bad things. It's called sin. We're all sinners. Christ died for sinners. The the only difference between you and them is that you turn from your sin theoretically, right? But disobedience to God is sin. So there you go. And we can point fingers at John all day, but again, we consider people they claim the allegiance to Jesus who came to seek and save the lost, but then we call out for destruction for the sinner. And, and we lament what's going on. So Jonah's sin and ignorance is pointed out by God through this, through this little plant, right? Which I, I think is fascinating. We have, we have the second miracle of Jonah. This plant wasn't there in the morning, and then the next morning, boom, you got a plant that's enough to cover shade. So the root of sin, right? We know Jonah's sin is, is preferring Nineveh's destruction. So what's the root of that? Well, the root of Jonah's sin was preferring his comfort over Nineveh's need. Why did he want Nineveh destroyed? Because it would be more comfortable for Israel if they just didn't have to worry about it. It would be one less pagan society that they had to worry about. And, and how many of us as Christians find ourselves, well, we won't, we won't say we want God to, to burn them up or destroy them, but how many times we find ourselves saying, well, if, if so-and-so wasn't around, we could really be good Christians. Or, or if we didn't, if we didn't have to deal with this, then we could, we could be good Christians. And when I was teaching school, I, I, I constantly would hear things like, uh, well, you know, as Christians, we're not allowed to talk about the Bible in school or, or we shouldn't bring up God. And yet it's funny to me how many number of times I was perfectly fine bringing up God in the Bible and I, I never, I never got fired for it. I don't, it didn't happen, Robert. Can you believe that? Like, I actually preached to a whole class one time on accident and, and nothing came out of it. Right, except a few students were like, wow, he, that was really good, you know. Um, I don't even remember what the sermon was about, but somebody asked me a question, we got to talking, and then fast forward 15 minutes later, and I was like, y'all should be doing work. What are you doing here? Quit listening to me. Anyway, uh, but that's, I mean, the root of the sin is preferring comfort over the end of the And this is, this is what God puts to Jonah, right? What's more important, the plant or the people? So as we as a church, as, as we as Christians think about that and wrestle with that, What's, what is more important? Whatever that plant is that makes us comfortable, that, that, that it's, it's our little blanket that we can hold on to and, and say, this, I, this feels good. This is, this is the way we've always done it. I, when I was a kid, it made me give, I got warm and fuzzies because of this thing. Or is it the people that need to hear the gospel? And, and for those of you who are like, is he going to try to change everything? Again, this is not about the way it should look. This is about what our attitude should be. If our attitude is, I want my comfort, the rest of them be damned, that is a bad attitude. That is not of the Holy Spirit. And, and if, we, if, we, if we have that in our mindset, that what I want is more important than, than anything else, then you've missed the gospel altogether. Because the gospel is not, Jesus came to make you happy and comfortable and fat and wealthy and be spoiled. Jesus came to save you from your sin so that you did not go to hell. And now that you're saved, you have a task to tell others as well. So the root of sin, Jonah's sin is his comfort. So now, in our discomfort, right, that's when we're willing to listen to the Lord and repent. So we are very uncomfortable right now, and that's okay. You can be uncomfortable. I was very uncomfortable reading this a long time ago. 
because I had realized that what I wanted had become more important than what God wanted. And so as, as we look to what, what should we do, how to react to this, I think we can actually look at the Ninevites as a good example here. This is one of the few places where you can look at the pagan city and say, maybe we should do what they did. Because what did they do? They repented. They turned from their evil. They put on sackcloth and ashes. This, this, is, a, this is a physical symbol for, for their repentance and for their sorrow. They are weeping over their sin. And, and they had a king wise enough to say, look, everybody needs to do this, and, and hopefully we can avoid this destruction if we all do this. So this is, this is me saying, hopefully we can avoid further destruction if we all turn and repent and look to God in obedience and for wisdom. And the beauty is that last point in the bulletin, there's no sin too great for God to wash clean if we only repent and turn to him. So if you find yourself in, in the sanctuary today and you're like, dude, I just, I don't even know who Jesus is. I'll just come to check things out. What is going on here? Right? Well, the beauty of the gospel is this, that though we are sinners and though we've died, or we will die and we can go, we will go to hell. Christ died for us so that we don't have to. That the sin that has, has corrupted us, that causes us to do evil, the sin that breaks us away from God, that keeps us out of heaven, that sin can be washed clean if we return to Christ because he's already paid the price. So we don't even have to work for it. We just have to turn to him and say, Lord, forgive me, cleanse me of my sin. And he will do that. And Christian, for those of you that have been Christians for a long time now, and you find yourself, how can I be more obedient? How can I listen to God more? How can I avoid these fishy moments in my life? It's, it's very simple. You do what the Ninevites did. And you do what you did when you first came to Christ. You turn from your sin, you leave your evil and violent ways, and you put your heart back to God. And, and as we go through life, sometimes we pick up new sins, and then we find those sins holding us down. Well, that's, that's when you give them up. You drop them down and, you, and you, you keep going. It's not that you're not saved. It's just you just picked up a bad sin that you got to drop again. It's that ongoing growth as a Christian. And as we mature in life, we learn what it means to be obedient and to surrender. But, but if the attitude is, I want what I want, you'll never surrender and you'll never grow as a Christian. The attitude has to become, God, what are you calling me to? What is the task that I've been given Help me to walk willingly in that task. So as we close, Mike's going to open us up an invitation. The invitation time is, is just simply a time to respond to what God has given you. So what, what is God calling you to today? If, if, if God is calling you to salvation for the first time, I'll be down here up in the front. I would love to pray with you and talk with you about what that means, and, and we can follow up afterwards if we need to, and, and we can go through that process of what that looks like. For the Christian, it, it could be an invitation of just simply repenting from the sin that, that has hold you down, held you down. Whatever, whatever it is that, that you know is in your life that needs to go away, or it could simply be something that you've not picked up, that God is calling you to a task. If you're, if you're not sure what you should be doing or what you could be doing, I, I've got a cheat sheet for you, right? In the back of your bulletin, there's a whole list of things that the church could help use some help with right now. And I thank God for those that are, that are willing to, to step up and get things done in this church. I, I am baffled at the obedience of some of the people in this church. It just, it amazes me how just like, just without, a lot of times without even prompting, it's just boom, it's done. But I also know there's a lot of us that we need more prompting, that we're not, we don't have that initiative because we're, we're, we're just distracted. It's not necessarily evil in itself, it's easy to get distracted. So I gave you a cheat sheet. So look over that cheat sheet, pray over that. What, which one of the, I'm not asking you to do it all, just pick one. And what can you do? Pray about that as we go through the invitation. Last thing in the invitation is it's also time to, to join this church. So some of you have been coming a long time, and we love you. We'd love to see you. But it's probably time to join the church and actually be a part of the mission of what's going on. And, and, and we can talk about what that looks like as well. But I'm going to pray it as Mike comes to lead us. Father, we thank you again for this time. We thank you for this word. Lord, I thank you for, for what the story of Jonah has done in my own life and, and, and just the reminder of, of what you've called me to do. So, Father, I pray that as each one of us look at Jonah and, and we, we recognize the times in our life where we, we may not have actually been in a fish, but it sure felt like it. We know that those are the times that, that you heard our prayers, you heard our distress, and you've sustained us and carried through, us through that. 
So, Father, as, as we in a church find ourselves in a situation that is very fish-like and that we're, we're not sure which way is up because it, we're struggling to see the light because we're just surrounded by the, by the circumstances of our day, I pray that, that you, you give us, just give us a clear answer for what you have for us. Lord, in all the confusion and all the distress and the worry and the, and the we're not sure what's going to happen tomorrow stuff, I pray that we, we can rest on the firm foundation that you've already seen tomorrow. You know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow, and none of this is a surprise, and none of what will happen in the coming years will be a surprise to you. That you've, you've seen the end, and, and we can know that the end is good because Christ has come, Christ has vanquished death, and that if we will simply turn to him, we will have eternal life. And that when, when this life is over, that we will sit with you and with our Savior. And Father, we also know that at the end of, of, these, of, of, of these pandemics that will come, at the end of these wars and at these rumors of wars and at the distress, that at the end of this age, your son will return and that we will see him coming through the clouds and, and every eye will see that Jesus is Lord. And for those of us that have, have repented of our sin and have turned and received eternal life, we will be caught up with him to live forever with you. Father, but we also know that the, the other side of that story is that those, those that are going to be left here, those that will not be caught up with the Son, will be left to doom and destruction. So, Father, I pray that anybody hearing this prayer right now understands that destruction is coming, that Jonah's words for Nineveh are just as true for us, that death and destruction is on its way, and yet you love us and you care for us and you sent your Son to die for us to pay the penalty of that sin, to, to provide the cure for that sin, to give eternal life and to give eternal hope. And that our faith is not faith that things might work out, but our faith is that things will be good again. And they will be as you designed them to be. Because at the end of this age, sin will be no more, death will be no more, crying will be no more. We won't even have a son because we will see by the light of your glory. Father, I pray to hasten the day that that comes because some of us are tired. But Lord, for those of us that are tired, we also know that we can, we can rest in you. And as your prophet Isaiah said, that those who wait on the Lord will mount up on wings as eagles and we will run and not grow faint. So Father, for those of us that are tired, I pray that today is the day that we, we sit back and wait upon you and rest in you so that tomorrow we can mount on those wings as eagles and soar and share the love that you have for us and the love that you have for lost people that are dying and going to hell and there's no reason for them to because salvation comes. So Father, I pray that as each of us wrestle with the task at hand that you've given us, I pray that we'll quit wrestling and just walk in obedience. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come. Four fourteen. Pleading, pleading for you and for 
for me. Why should we linger and heed not his mercies? Mercies for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, old sinner, come home. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity. We especially thank you for the message, Father. We just pray, Father, as we go forward into this week, into the days to come, we just um, are reminded to uh, do what you have, it, what we've been called to do by you, Father, and just to uh, be obedient. We just thank you so much for this church family and for this uh, this community you've put us in, Father. Just help us to uh, carry the gospel. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.